old ways the next day. I want it to haunt me. I want God to continue to press down on me and, and stir my life and shake me up. And uh, I, I will tell you this. If, if you're under attack today, the devil's just mad because uh, he, he's, he, he's, he's mad because something good is fixing to come your way. Something powerful is going to happen. And guess what? The reason why he's mad, it's not that the fact that something good is going to happen for you. The reason why the adversary is so upset with you is because there's nothing he can do to stop you from pursuing what God's going to give you. Amen. Praise God. Joshua chapter number 2, verse number 1. I'm going to skip over to 15 after verse number 1. It says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house. Everybody say a harlot's house. Named Rahab and lodged there. Verse number 15. Then she let them down by a cord through the window. For her house was upon the town wall. And she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you. And hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned. And afterward may ye go your way. It says in verse number 17, And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread, and the window which thou didst let us down by. Thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the, of the doors of thy house into the street. I want you to listen to this. His blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head. If any hand be upon him, and if thou utter his this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear verse 21 and she said according unto your words so be it and she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet line in the window I want to preach on this thought the results of crying out and then I want to subtitle this you found me Jesus when Jesus finds you, you can't find God because God's not lost. He's got to find us because we're lost. Let's go before the Lord before we are seated today. And let's ask God to take dominion over this service right now. God, we're asking you, Lord, to take over this building right now. To speak to every individual that is under the sound of my voice. And I pray, God, that you would speak your word into every heart that is in this place here right now. I pray, God, that you would bind spirits that is not of you, God. And you would loose your giftings and your miracles into this service, Lord Jesus. That whatsoever we shall ask in thy name, God, that it would come to pass, Lord. Lord, you said, knock and the door shall be open. Ask and we shall receive. For everyone that asketh, Lord, you said you will provide. And we're asking today, God, as we cry out in your precious, wonderful name, that we plead the blood of this congregation, in this congregation right now. We plead the blood of Jesus right now in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated today in Jesus' magnificent, wonderful name. Amen. Things don't always go as planned. How many agree with that? They don't. You make plans and it doesn't happen the way that you thought it should go. 
Brother Joe, it's so good to see you in the house of God, man. I didn't see you out there. I'm, I'm so glad to see you. I'm, I'm glad to see everybody in the house of God. Amen. I, I could call everybody out name by name right now, but um, but they they don't. And uh, Rahab's parents, they didn't want the lifestyle that she was living uh, to be her actual career. That's not what they wanted. They 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 don't desire that because you don't desire failure for your kids. You don't do that. You don't think of, well, I want them to stumble and to fall. You, As a human, as a parent, you don't want that to happen for your kids. But life has its ups and downs, so it's going to happen. You're going to have seasons of getting. You're going to have seasons of, of all kinds of different trans, uh, uh, things that happen. We, we, we can't control the seasons of this life. But if we continue with our minds on God and our trust in him, and reside in him and not out of him. I believe that we, as long as we go through the storm, we can go through the storm with Jesus Christ. I don't want to go through a storm with the world. I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to do any of that. But, but, but in this story here with the parents, uh, um, I'm sure that they weren't hoping for uh, her daughter to be a harlot. Rahab is living a terrible life in a terrible place. And what she's doing, the Bible says that she's worshiping false gods. And Israel is making their way to the city of Jericho, to the wall of Jericho. Now, God is about to bring the walls down. You know the story, how God comes in and he brings them down. And he's fixing to make things worse besides her lifestyle and everything terrible about her. She, uh, she lives, the Bible says, what we just read this, she lives on the walls. She's literally on the pathway of destruction. Huh? Because the Bible says this is where she resides. She's on the path of destruction. She's on the path of the wrath of God. Now, you talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Nobody wants to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. You want to be at the right place at the right time. Praise God. I will, I've, I'm always at the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> when I was 12 years old, I was walking from school. I had my backpack, and a guy right here next to me goes, Whoa, look at that. And I'm like, look at what? He goes down dollar bill from my my pathway he was like man i came up i was like man i was at the wrong place at the wrong time <laughs> praise god <laughs> sometimes it's for your benefit that when you're in the wrong place at the wrong the wrong time it, it really is you ever wonder how god uses people if you look at all the heroes of the bible they were always at the wrong place at the right the wrong time but god made something out of it can you imagine always being at the right place at the right time? Boy, that would be great. That would be awesome. But if we're going to learn a little something about who Jesus is, we're going to have to go through some walls and have them. Praise God. Amen. So you never want to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, especially when it comes to God, especially when it comes to him. And Rahab is living this, this terrible life in a terrible place. and <clears throat> She's in the worst place possible. She's, she's at the worst of the city. She's literally not even known for anything positive in the city because everybody looks at her as a failure, somebody who can never get through life, somebody who is just... You hear about somebody, a certain individual who had so many struggles in their life and their past life and all kinds of stuff, and they get cast stones. And, and this was her lifestyle. And, and here comes Joshua and, 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 and the Israelite, and they sent two spies into the land, and they knock on a door to get help. And it just so happens that the door that they're actually knocking on is Rahab's house. Read about that. It makes you wonder. What in the, isn't it funny that no matter how low a person can sink in their life, God can find a way to find them no matter where they reside. 
No matter where they're at, God can make a way. He can make a way for you that when you think that there's nothing possible, nothing that could happen, nothing that God can do, there's nothing in the world, but God makes a strange way for you to get through your trial and your problems. Why? I was at the wrong place at the right, wrong time, but God says, no, my translation is you were at the right place at the right time, and it's for me to fix your situation, not for you. Praise God. I remember being 13 years old. It was the year Bone Thugs and Harmony came out. <laughs> and I remember bumping that, that, uh, that song, See You at the Crossroads. See you at the crossroads, you will be lonely. Man, I thought, I was like, man, I feel God in this song. <laughs> Can I tell you something about them, them worldly rap songs when, it, when they speak of Jesus? What that is is they're crying out for God. They're just crying out for God. But I remember I, I was playing that song. I lived in the attic when I was 13. My mom put me in the attic. There was no room for me. And I lived in the attic, and I remember, <laughs> hush now. <laughs> but I remember that song was playing, and all of a sudden my mind started thinking. I started thinking, I started to think of my life. I started to think, man, I started to think about my mom. My mom wouldn't mind me talking about this, but I started thinking about how many times my mom is doing cocaine and, and she's, doing, uh, she's, she's doing meth in and, and, and the house and, and, I have, and, and, and my, uh, my family's fighting all the time and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the drugs and the alcohol and, 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 and all the fights and the, and the shootings and the gang bangings and everything that's going around in my life. And I'm like 13 years old. I'm thinking about all this stuff. I'm saying, I'm too young. I, I, I go to school and I see all these other kids. Some of these kids, there's some kids that have a good life. And, and here I am. I'm 13. I, I'm working construction. I'm trying to do my thing. And I'm living in an attic. And here I am in the attic. And, 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 and behind me is a song that's singing, See you at the crossroads. And I'm like, and I get on my knees. And I started to pray. For the very first time in my entire life, in 1993, I was praying on my knees. And I started to ask God. I said, here's my prayer. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I said, God, if you are real, you will take me out of this life. You'll take my family, my sister, and you'll take us and you'll move us away. And you'll protect us. And, and, and when I started to pray that, Something started to get a hold of me. I started to start. I started to tear up, and and I was crying. I remember bawling on my on the floor. I started crying. I didn't understand what was going on, but I started to cry. And I said, God, if you're real, you'll take us out of this environment, and you'll start to do these things. And and just to make a long story short, God heard my cry because God moved us to a farming town called Porterville. No gangs there. There wasn't even drugs there at the time. It, they, when I moved there, I was trying to start my own gang. Went to school and I was like, you guys tag on walls? They're like, oh my God, no. And I was like, man. And so, so it was like God heard my cry. And and I'm not trying to talk, tell my, my, my story of my life, but... Some could actually stand right now and testify. I don't know how he found me. I don't know how he found me, but, but he did find me. I didn't find him. He found me. How did he find you? Because somewhere you started to ask and cry to God and say, God, if you're real, God, I need you in my life. God, I need you in this desperate time in my life right now you didn't find Jesus Jesus found you hallelujah never let the devil convince you that that you found him you didn't find anything I was lost in sin but mercy found me grace found me hallelujah deliverance from Jesus found me praise God 
That's why I can't patty cake it when it comes to worship. When, I, I, when it comes to praising God and giving God your, your rightful praise and, and, and being in his presence because I, I know if I had not been, if it had not been for the Lord, amen, who was on my side, I would not even be inside this building right now praising and worshiping God. If it wasn't for his mercy and if it wasn't for his grace, I wouldn't be here right now to testify about it. I would not be able to say anything. That's why you want to praise him when, when you get the chance and the opportunity because it's not because you found him, it's because he found you when you were lost and undone without God. Jesus, thank you, God, for, for finding me, for finding a wretch like me. I'm grateful. Some of us are not grateful enough to, to that, that, that where you're sitting right now in this place where we know who he is and his name is Jesus Christ and we know that he is the God of yesterday, today, and forever and we know that the Bible says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. So saith the Lord. He is the Father of all, in us all, through us all and we have revelation of Jesus Christ, of who he is and there's people and sitting in Las Vegas right now. They're listening to somebody else uh, that's saying he's the second person in the Godhead. Let me tell you something. I'm grateful I know who he is. Because when that day comes, when the Bible says, when you come before God, he says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. He's talking about the iniquity that we worked was not of the truth of God. But it was just following after the big names, following after my own heart. Did you know your heart could deceive you? Your heart's a big deceiver. Just ask a bunch of 14-year-old girls. <laughs> oh, man, he broke my heart. He deceived me. Oh, I thought I was in love. <laughs> yeah, Sister Nancy laughing over there. Praise God. That's why I'm going to write up a contract in crayon with, for my daughters. Here's a contract. You not fall in, don't fall in love until you're 79 years old. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody said amen. Somebody shout, he found me. Praise God. Hallelujah. And he found Rahab. Now, why did, listen, why did God, why in the world did God choose to find Rahab? I mean, everything that God does, he does it on purpose. Everything is planned out. Everything is designed by God, right? He literally orders these two men where they are headed, where they're going, where they're directed. He directs them. He moves them. He pushes them. This, this, this is not a coincidence. These men are literally on a, 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 a divine mission from God. A divine mission. And God knows exactly what door they're going to go and knock on. Praise God. He knew when Rahab got that house, there was a divine encounter coming years later. And she's in the house, and they knock on the door, why does God choose Rahab? Surely there was somebody else who was more qualified, who had a better uh, reputation in Jericho other than Rahab had. Because Rahab didn't have, nobody liked her. She had a bad reputation in that town. But God uses the bad. That's why I laugh when some people are like, oh, you can't save that guy. He's bad, man. He's a heroin addict. There's no way, God. You need to save this guy. He's all up in a suit, knows what's going on. No, God's not. Am I saying God's not interested in people in suits? No. I'm saying God, uh, I don't know how to say this. I wish I could say it in Spanish. But when you're down to nothing, when you feel like you have no other place to go, your heart starts to, Look for something greater than what can be provided for you. There's got to be a God somewhere. 
there's got to be a God that can help us in the midst of the situation. If you notice, people with options don't get further with God. People that have a, a, an option or a plan B with all these other stuff in place, I'm not saying don't have a plan. Always have a plan, but have a plan in Jesus Christ. But when you have a plan outside of God, you don't have the favor of God. It, it, it can't. It, it's not going to help you. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, we find our answer here in Joshua chapter 2, in verse number 10 and 11. If you want to read, you can read along if you'd like, but you don't have to. And now, when she's meeting this, these men, this is literally what she's telling them, okay? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When ye come out of Egypt, everybody say, come out of Egypt. And what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sion, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. All right? Now get ready for it. Verse number 11. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above. Everybody say in heaven above. And in earth beneath. Here's why God chose Rahab in the midst of her trial, in the midst of her state of mind of recklessness. And, and she could, the, the reason why is because through all of this pain and all of this suffering and all of this anguish, she was in pain and desperate need and she didn't know which direction to take. But she said, there, there is a God. I know there's a God that can help me. I know there's a God that can come for me. I'm in a mess right now. But God, hear my cry. I know you're real. I know you're real. There's something about people that are lost uh, on their way to hell, but they're still acknowledging there's something about God. There's something about there is a God that can help me with power and authority and dominion over my circumstance. Hallelujah. Check this out. She said, he is, this is my favorite part of the scripture. She said, he is a God in heaven above. That's why I had to repeat this. He's, she said, he's a God of heaven above. And he's God in earth beneath. In other words, when I look up, he's there. When I look down, he's there. When I look forward, he's there. When I look behind me, he's there. When I look on my left, he's there. When I look on my right, he's there. What are you saying? I'm saying it doesn't matter what the world tries to do to you. It don't matter where the adversary comes from. Wherever your direction is, wherever your turn, God is going to be in that direction. When you're face down and you don't know what to do and your head is buried, God is saying, look up, then draw nigh because my spirit is near. I'm going to help you in your situation. His power is greater than everything you look at, everything you listen to, everywhere you go. Praise God or feel. Rahab, she, she said he is, a, he is God. These people are all afraid of you, and I know you're God. They fear you. He's God over everything. This is why I believe God chooses her because she's acknowledging him. Because he knows in the midst of pagan idolatry, there's somebody who stands in the midst of that and recognizes I'm terrible, I'm pathetic, I'm the lowest of lows, but I know a God who sits on high and looks on low. And lo, will never forsake me. And so I'm going to acknowledge him. Praise God. 
Let me tell you something. Don't ever roll your eyes at somebody who's not living in truth. Or somebody who's not living for God right now. Don't, 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 ever, don't ever get to that point where, well, you, know, pff, you know, they're not living for God. They're not worshiping God. Uh, because they could be worshiping their God at the time they're worshiping God. But, but, but God may have a plan for that person. God may have a design plan, amen, for their life. Uh, and, and we may not even know it, uh, but, but, but every single situation I look at when false religion, false doctrine, and charismatics and all kinds of things, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't roll my eyes at them. I don't want to put them in hell. I want to, I, I, my prayer is, God, if you can give them truth, uh, if you can give them a hunger in their heart, uh, if you can just give them a desire for them to step out, uh, Lord, I know you can do a work in their life. Praise God. And that plan might be them who's going to join you if you'll just help them get, get in because they recognize I need him in my situation as well. I need God to, to, to do something in my life. I've got to have him. Amen. And so... Such were some of us. And Rahab, she said, your God is God over everything. This is where she recognized who God was and just told everybody that God is bigger. He is bigger and better than anything in this world. And Rahab was on the pathway of getting to know who God really was right here. Now, she's not an idiot. Because watch what, what, watch what they do. She said, since you're coming to take over, and since you knocked on my door, I'm going to pray a big, giant prayer. <laughs> How many like to pray big prayers? Not small little prayers. I'm talking about big prayers. You just heard Sister Langford talk about de declaring war. You're going to get what you ask for. <laughs> when you sit there and you say, I want my family saved. I want my son in the church. I want my family in church. Let me tell you something. Asking comes with a price to pay. God's going to put you through something in order for this to occur. Now that's, I know that's a mouthful to say. Not a lot of people is even going to get or understand that. But if you're ready to fight hell with everything you've got, you've got to be ready when you say prayers like that. God, I want revival. There's going to be a price for revival. God, I want my family saved. There's going to be a price for your family to be saved. I want this. I want that. There's, it, it, there's got to be the pressing uh, of the olive. The, the anointing's got to come out. The oil's got to spill in order for God to do something. God's got to press and squeeze you and, and, and to the point where God says, do you really love me? Uh, uh, God, you got to understand Jesus had people come around him and say, I love you, Pastor. I love you, man of God. I love you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Peter went up to God and told him, he says, I love you. I'll never leave you. And, and, and Jesus said, you'll deny me. And, and he says, you're crazy. But he did it anyways. And, 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 and I know what it's like to have people come to you and say, Pastor, I'm behind you 100%. I'll never leave you. I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to stand with you. And I appreciate the ones that have. But I understand that when they, when we talk like those words with God and we begin, we begin to speak those kind of words, we better back it up. We really do. We need to back it up with, with our prayer life and say, I'm going to be challenged. Praise God. I'm going to be challenged. Amen for everything that I say. But she says, I'm going to pray a big old prayer, a giant prayer. When you come back, I want you to save me. I want you to save my dad. I want you to save my mother, my brother, my sisters, my aunts, my uncles, everything. My stuff and all their stuff. You know what gets God's attention? It's not when you just say, God, I want you to save me. It's when you say things like, God, save my family as well. Save this person and save that individual and save the person across the street. Save the individual who I bank with. Save uh, my co-workers, God. God sees that. Save my family. I'm not, 
just satisfied getting a miracle. I need my kids to get a miracle. I need my family to get a miracle. I need my uncle to pray through. I need my sister to get the Holy Ghost. I need, I need my family to be saved as well. Not just me, but I need them to be at an altar. Praise God. I need, I, I, listen, give me a family right now, in today, in here right now, that will tell hell, it's not just me that believes it, but my kids believe it as well. My family believes it as well. My, my siblings believe this as well as for me and for my house, we shall serve the Lord. Uh, it's not just me. You've got to declare it for your entire family. It's got to be a Lankford thing. It's not just one individual in the family. It's got to be the whole whole family one person cannot live for God we live in a day and time where there's more women living for God than there are men living for God now I know you know that and it's obvious the, 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 the day we live in it's obvious the day we live in there's more women that are working than men are working That's a true story. Praise God. Praise God. Well, this is a society we live in where women are making more money than men are. There, now, is there anything wrong with that? I'm, I'm a little old school. <laughs> so I, I always thought the man works. And, you know, the woman stays home and cooks, cleans, makes the bed, and does the dishes, rubs my feet. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But we live in a different world today. Today, it literally takes two incomes to make a living. So it's a whole different environment. We don't live in the 50s no more. We're living in the millennium. This is 2019 going into 20. So obviously, it's a different perspective. I don't even know why I'm even talking about this. <laughs> but, amen. Praise God, anyhow. Well, that was for free. And she said, when you come, verse number 13, if you, if you want to follow along, you don't have to. And you get my mom and my dad and my brothers and my sisters and all that we have, deliver our lives from death. Watch this. She said, we need to be, are you ready? Delivered. Delivered. You know why God couldn't reject her cry for deliverance? Because a few years earlier when his own people needed deliverance, his own people that cried out, when they cried out to him, he came down out of heaven and he pulled them out of Egypt in one night. And he's the same God to everyone, the sinner, and the saint, every single person. And if someone cries out for deliverance, if somebody is sitting there begging for God, crying with tears coming out of their eyes, and saying, God, deliver me. It doesn't matter if it's an individual that is sitting on the pew or somebody who's sitting underneath a bridge in Las Vegas. It doesn't matter if they're running an aisle inside the house of God or they're lost and undone without him somewhere else in their home. God responds to cries. It doesn't matter if they cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. There is a God that will come out of heaven and reach down and guess what? He will deliver you. Let me, here's, here's a question I'd like to ask you. Is anybody grateful? Is anybody thankful tonight, today, how far his mercy reached when he reached for you? Anybody. Because he cannot reject the cry of deliverance. Or, um, deliverance. You know why? Because Jesus, he loves it when we say, I need you, God. I need you. Everybody say, I need you, Jesus. He loves to hear that. 
I need you, Jesus. He doesn't want to hear someone say, well, I could use you, God. No, he wants to hear someone say, I have no other, other God. I have no other direction. I need God in my life. I need you, God. Praise God. You know, God told Joseph, he told Joseph this. He, he said, Joseph, Joseph said, yeah. He said, he said, the Israelites, he said, my people are going to be bound for 400 years. He said, all right, 400 years. And so there was a prison. And you read the word of God, there, there's an imprisonment of the children of, of, of Israel, the Hebrew children. They were enslaved for how long? 400 years. Now, that's a false story. Because the Bible says they were actually, now that is, that's accurate in the beginning what God told them. But what happened when we read three chapters later, and it says they were enslaved for 430 years. You know why? They were enslaved for 30 extra years after their 400 sentence. God never responded to them until the Bible says they cried out for deliverance after 30 years of 400 years. And God says, I heard their cries. Moses, I've heard their cries. He says it took 30 years for them after 400 years for them to actually cry out. The reason why God doesn't respond to some people is because you're not crying out for him. You're not asking God. You're just, you're just going through the motions and you're saying this is how it is. and This is the way religion is. But God is saying I want to hear my people cry. I want to hear. I want to see you. How serious are you with him today? How much are you with God? Oh, but as soon as they started crying, the Bible says he started moving. God responds to your cries. He responds to your cries. When you cry out for him and you get on your knees and you talk to him. I'm not saying you get in a, when you're in a funk and you get on the ground and you just start crying. I mean, you can if you like to. But God, it, it takes a build up. When you're on the ground and you're starting to pray and you talk to him, trust me, if you're sincere, Brother Samples, if you're sincere enough, God will respond to your cry. Because you ever get to the point where you're like, it's prayer time. It's prayer time. And as soon as I hear that, my mind goes back like 40 years ago or 35 years ago where my grandmother used to yell at us, it's prayer time. And we'd be on the Catholic bench, be praying. And I always looked at it as like, oh, I don't do that. And, and when I hear that, that comes back to me. <laughs> Lying devil. <laughs> but I know how powerful prayer can be. But guess who doesn't want to pray? Me. I don't want to pray. But the enemy wants to pray. This flesh doesn't want to pray. Your body doesn't want to pray. But your spirit wants to. You know why? Because the Bible says your spirit hungers. Your human spirit hungers and thirsts after righteousness of God. So you're starving for, for that living water to, to move and to move inside you. But, but, but the outer shell does not want to lift up its hands. And it doesn't want to pray. And it doesn't want to talk to God. And, 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 and I can't condemn you for that. No one can tell you you're going to go to hell for that. that uh, no one can judge you for that. The only enemy you have is yourself. It's not the devil. It's not your neighbor. It's you and your big fat self. Or skinny self. Or middle self. <laughs> Praise God. I didn't mean to say that. Forgive me. I'm talking about me, I guess. <laughs> but but we don't. We don't want to pray. We don't want to cry. We don't want to get our knees. But I, but check this out. Let's make a declaration right now. How many of you? I don't don't even raise your hands. I I don't want you to make this kind of a public commitment. But how many of you will go home this week 
and all the way up until Sunday, next Sunday, we'll pray for 10 minutes in your home. 10 minutes, just give God 10 minutes. I'm not asking 10 hours. I'm not, every, we all, everyone works. But give God 10 minutes of your time. Get in a prayer closet somewhere, somewhere where you could be alone, not in the dinner table, not, at, not in the living room if everyone's there. Get somewhere where you can be alone in your house where you know you got 10 minutes of silence where no one's coming around and you get on your knees and you ask God to forgive you of all your sins. You say, God, I repent of my sins. And then you start to worship him and praise him and set a timer, set your clock. And just say, i got 10 minutes to do this. I'm going I'm to fulfill God's will. And, and you pray, and I guarantee you that 10 will turn to 20. The 20 will turn to 40. Because you're going to fall in love with God. It's going to get deep in your house. That flow of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You're going to pour it into your home. To the point where your kids are going to walk in. And they're going to feel something in that house. It's not because of you, it's because of God, but it's because what you brought in, God, into your house, you allowed the Holy Ghost to anoint, to, to, to fall into your home. I guarantee you there's going to be some changes. There's going to be some things. People are going to notice the way you look, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way everything. Give God 10 minutes. Just give him 10 minutes a day. Don't matter what time it is. It could be 5 in the morning, 4 in the morning, 6 in the morning, 10 in the morning. But just give God 10 minutes. If you'll do that, praise God, I guarantee you, something's going to happen. Something's going to develop. Because when we do something like that, trust me, God's going to hear you. He's going to listen to you. He's going to hear your cries. It's going to start off with a prayer. God, hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, praise God. Amen. That, that, yeah. But until we start to get into a situation with him of moaning and groaning and crying and the tears start to come, that's a point where you don't want to stop. Keep, keep praying. Keep talking to him. Keep praying until you have no control of your own body anymore and you watch what God's going to do for you. Hallelujah. Somebody believes it. When Rahab started crying, you got to get me out of here, musicians, if you want to come this time. You got to get me out of here. You got to save my family. You know what God said? God says, I heard that. I heard exactly what you said. Just like right now, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the strongholds is, if you'll cry out to him, he'll rescue you right now. Whatever it is, you can cry at an altar today in his house, in his presence. Yeah, but God, I, I made plans. I made a declaration with the pastor just now. I'm going to do it tomorrow when I get home, and I'm going to spend 10 minutes. That's awesome. But go beyond what you could even imagine what God could do for you by giving everything to him and saying, God, you own, you, you are the landlord of this soul. You're the landlord of my house, of my car, of my kids, of my wife, my marriage, my job. You, you own everything, God. And I'm going to cry out to you. I'm going to cry until there's no more tears to cry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout until there's no more shouting that could happen. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you everything that I possibly have that is running through the course of these veins. And the, this body, God, I'm just going to give it to you, God, like I've never given it to you before. We can stir hell if we really wanted to tonight. We can reveal hell if we really wanted to tonight. What do you mean by that? I'm talking if we really got in tune with God tonight, God would show himself and the devil would, 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 would have to leave whatever he is doing to disturb God's people or certain people. And there, there's no power there's no power that, that Satan has over your life. He, he, he's got no control. He's got no authority. He has nothing. 
He cannot destroy you. He cannot. It doesn't matter what you heard. God is the biggest, the most powerful, the most awesome thing that you could ever have in your life. The majesty of God. Let's all stand together in unity with God. Hallelujah. You know, the interesting thing about crying out for God, you know, when the Bible talks about when you cry out to God, your body is dying out to God. You're killing the outside to revive the inside. This is where intercession comes into place. You're interceding for another soul. And so your inside is crying on the outside. And I remember this this Hispanic lady. Uh, she had came and visited our church one night. And we weren't even in revival. God was just, God was just moving. Us. And she, she came to the altar. She never been to church before. She never, no one gave her a Bible study. She just walked in from the invitation of somebody on the street. She came in. She was at the altar. No one told her to go to the altar. She just went to the altar during the preaching. She, they, the preaching was going on, and she came to the altar and she started to pray. And I remember looking at her from the side view, and I remember her looking up, and I remember seeing tears flowing down her face. And I, I remember thinking, God's going to give her the Holy Ghost because she is wanting God so bad. Not realizing her marriage was on the rocks. and Her husband had left her, ran off to another state, took all their money, and She's left with all the kids. and Here she is, broken, busted, and messed up, and she's crying, and all these tears are flowing. And I remember looking at her, and we all started to come towards her. No one even had to lay hands on her. She already began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit of God gave the utterance. She had the Holy Ghost. She got the Holy Ghost. She started crying out to God. God gave her the Holy Ghost. And she, we, she told us her testimony and what God, how she felt, and how she f felt God in this place. And, and, and she says, I'm, I'm going to pray for my family. And she came back to church the next service. And when she came back, she was there lifting up her hands. And here's the funny point. This is the funny part. Here I am. I had the Holy Ghost for two years at this time. And she out worshiped me. And I'm thinking, she's got something to worship God about. I can't even, I can't, I, she's putting me in shame on worshiping God. It's not the fact she was deliberately trying to put me to shame. She fell in love with God. When you fall in love with Jesus, it doesn't matter who's looking at you. You don't care where you're at. You're going to give God his rightful praise. It doesn't matter who's looking, who's talking, or who's walking. You know that God is bigger than the person behind you. It doesn't matter. She worshiped God. She, and I remember her crying out. She would cry out, Jesus. And she would just start praying and crying and tears flowing. And she was talking in tongues. And she came to the altar and she cried and she cried. And then it uh, wasn't long enough. Her family started coming to church. Her husband came back. Uh, her kids uh, got the Holy Ghost. Her husband got the Holy Ghost. She didn't stop right there. She kept crying more, and she cried and cried. And then her mom walked in the door, and her mom got the Holy Ghost. And then her Thea came in, and Thea got the Holy Ghost. And her uncle and her dad finally came in, and he got the Holy Ghost. She kept crying. She didn't stop. Someone said, if she doesn't stop, our church ain't going to fit everybody in this building. She kept crying and crying and crying and crying. She, she literally told the church, how to fight she said you don't fight she says if you want your marriage to work she says you gotta fight on your knees she says if you want a job you gotta fight on your knees if you want to be delivered you gotta fight on your knees if you want something to work in your life she says you gotta cry out to God she said you gotta fight on your knees for God she says that's how I want my family she said because I fought and I cried out, God deliver me. 
God deliver my family, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my husband. She cried out just like the children of Israel did. They cried out 30 years after 400. They knew 400 years wasn't going to work. Uh, they knew 30 after 30 years uh, the promise, uh, amen, wasn't going to come to pass until they started to cry out. Say, God, deliver us. And the Bible says he delivered them in one night. God hears your cries today. Hallelujah. Every head bowed right now. I want every head bowed at this time. I want, I want, just, just obey the Holy Ghost right now. I want to obey the Holy Ghost. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Jesus, blood of Jesus. Oh. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want you to imagine with me. I want you, if you just take a few seconds with me right now, if you would, just take 60 seconds. I want you to imagine yourself on your knees with tears flowing out of your face. And your tears are everywhere. And you're crying out. Now I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine Jesus' feet are the feet that your tears are falling on. And his hand is reaching down and he's touching you by your head and he's assuring your spirit everything is going to be alright everything is going to work out well hallelujah Jesus do you want to talk to him today do you want to love him today he's here right now for you he's here right now waiting for you to cry out to him He's been here the whole time. He's been here forever. He's been here before you even got here and said, I'm just waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. These altars are open for anybody who wants to talk to him today, who wants to get to know the King of Kings. These altars are open for anybody who wants to start all over with God, start a relationship with him all over again. Lord, I want to cry at your feet. I want to cry at the foot of the cross today. Hallelujah. I want to give you your rightful praise. I want to love you today, Jesus. Deliver me, God, from me. Deliver us, Jesus. Deliver us today. God, these are the results of crying. Jesus, you found me. You found me, Jesus. That's it. Just cry out to him today. That's all he wants is your tears. He wants your tears. He wants a broken heart so he can put it back together again. He wants you to come to him broken so he can make you whole again. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, don't hold back today. Don't hold back today. Don't hold your tears back today. Say, here I am, God. I'm crying out to you, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb.